I said this afternoon that some of the things that we have to talk about when we consider the law might make us feel a bit uncomfortable. And that's because we're used to living in our democracy with our modern justice system and the values which are pushed at us every day in every form of media do get into our brains. We're going to talk tonight about God's justice code and the regulatory principles of the law of Moses. And I think you'll find that it's incredibly different to what we live under in this land. We have to realise that our God who gave these laws has not changed. God is not a moving creature. There's a great benefit for us to realise that how God administers justice and to see that his morals do not change just because man has moved on. As we said this afternoon, most of these principles, these conditions, these morals will be re-established re when the kingdom of God is upon the earth and the mortal population have to be educated and they will be in a worse situation than were the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. They suffered from a degree of ignorance, a lack of organisation, no religion in a formal sense for many years. Today's world have their minds filled with rubbish, with all kinds of wrong values. And it's going to take a very strict and severe law to get them to appreciate the goodness and kindness and the wisdom of God. They have moved so far away from divine principles. Now remember the reason from the law. This is the ESV of 1 Timothy chapter 1. The law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient. And there are many things about the law of Moses that were regulatory and disciplinary. We have a very clear picture of God's morals. How matters would be investigated. What judgments would be made and that they would be carried through. Let's look at what it says in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 11. According to the sentence of the law, when they brought the matter to the judge or the priest and the decision was made, it had to be implemented, it had to be accepted, and it had to be followed through. If people denied that, it was a stoning offence. So here was a law that was absolutely to be carried out. So this national code of law was to restrain the excesses that human nature is capable of. There were definitions of what were crimes, what the punishments were, and there was a legal code around it. But the law also en encouraged people to act on higher motivations, and we'll look at those tomorrow, where they were encouraged to look at the example of God and the love of God and to, to do things because God did them. And they were given reasons for obedience when you come to the book of Deuteronomy. So we must realise that this was a law given to regulate an unspiritual nation. It was not given in the form of the law of Christ for individual character. It was given to regulate a nation. Now we're not a national ecclesia. We don't have power to stone offenders or administer punishments like the law of Moses prescribed. But it doesn't mean that God's ordered his view of what is right and what is sin. And we must protest when sin appears even in the ecclesia. It's a modern fallacy to imagine that God has somehow gone soft and kinder. And most churches have the view of God as a kindly old grandfather these days who would not ever give such laws again. And yet you read the New Testament, it's exactly the same as the old. These things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that law is absolute and it's very, very clear. You know, God's morality has not changed. There's a list of all the things that God said men should not do. Idolatry, witchcraft, all those other things that are there. Adultery, fornication, drunkenness, blasphemy, all of those things God said men should not do. And God's always wanted separation from the idolatrous religions of the world especially those that practice immorality. No toleration of alternate lifestyles. Married only in the faith. All of these things, honesty in dealings, all of these things are what God expects of mankind under his law. So let's look at this national code of law. Remember we're dealing with the justice system that God gave Israel to manage their nation. So, what were there? Well, there were things that regulated, as I said this afternoon, we'll just go over it again, God had to regulate 
a sinful nation. There were many things, like even appointing kings that God didn't want them to do, like divorcing their wives, which God didn't want them to do, like starting fights that God said he didn't want them to do. All of those things, God said, will happen. There will be brawling, there will be fighting. So this is the rules. These are the punishments that happen if people go too far when they fight. So you see, God's regulating the unspiritual things they would do. He did that particularly to events, prevent further abuse to those who were victims of crimes. But there were many examples. For example, they couldn't favour a wife. Even when you'd married your brother's wife to raise up seed, you couldn't show favouritism to one wife over the other. The divorce situation we mentioned, captives in battle, that happened. They had to be treated correctly, as we'll see in a later study. So there were regulations that God put into place that actually cut off the extremes of human behaviour. So don't ever think that you can say, well, God let that happen. God didn't want it to happen, but he knew it would. He knew men would have hard hearts and put away their wives. So he said there are rules around it that have to be observed. You see, God understands human nature will always fall short of the ideals. So some of the law was to regulate a sinful nation. But let's go to the, to the Justice Code because it's a great contrast to our modern legal system. Just think about some of these things in the law of, the law of Moses which were not in our legal system. Murderers, death penalty, no exceptions. It could not be paid off. You know, there was one death penalty you could actually buy off. We'll talk about that on Tuesday, God willing. There was one death penalty you could buy off. It was for when you caused the death by negligence. You could, in some circumstances, buy your way out of the death penalty. But in the case of deliberate murder, absolutely death penalty. No exceptions. That's why there were no repeat offenders. Think how often in our society people have been convicted of a crime, they get out after a few years and they do exactly the same and sometimes worse. People feared. Look what it says in verse 13 of chapter 17 of Deuteronomy. All the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. People will not flout the law of God defiantly because they'll know that the penalties are absolute. Let's come to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Look at this matter of the false witnesses. You know, in the courts it was important that witnesses actually be provided when a man was accused of something. And it was possible to go along to court and to accuse somebody falsely with the idea of getting them punished in some way, maybe put to death. Remember Naboth, falsely accused. Remember Jesus, falsely accused. Well, it says this. Do you know what I mean? Looking at chapter 19 and picking it up in verse 18. The judges shall make inquiry, and behold, if the witness be a false witness, that testified falsely against his brother, he shall do unto him as he had thought to have done to his brother. Again, look at the deterrent effect. So shall you put away evil from among you. It was incredibly dangerous to be a false witness. Because if you were caught out being a false witness, you suffered what you were trying to get inflicted on the other person. Now today, you'd be charged with perhaps perjury or maybe you know, plotting a crime or nothing more than that. You might get a tap on the hand and a bag of lollies. But in those days, it was, a, it was whatever you thought to inflict, you got. It's amazing there were still false witnesses that would, would, that would plead against Naboth. But again, you see the deterrent effect in verse 20. People shall henceforth commit no such evil thing among you. So there was a deterrent effect there. There were no prisons. I heard the other day that it costs in Australia, in the big prisons, it costs at least $50,000 a year to keep a person in prison for a year. You put 100 people in there, that's a lot of money. Put 500 in, it's even more money. And what do we do in the prisons? We train them to be better criminals. They learn from all the other crims inside. And you see it can be very, very detrimental to the person themselves to be put in a prison. There were no bail. You couldn't say, look, I'll, I'll, I'll get off until my case comes up in two years' time, which our courts are always so slow to do. There were no smart lawyers. You know, our justice system, you can be accused of a horrible crime. You do not have to say one word except not guilty. 
The Crown has to prove the case. You can stand there and they can't even cross-examine you unless your lawyer puts you on the stand. Under the law of Moses, like Achan, confess and give glory to the God of Israel. And men were made to confess what they had done. Our system, it's all up to the smartest lawyer sometimes to win the case. None of that under the law of Moses. There were no lawyers. Punishments were immediate, whether it was death, fines or stripes, instituted on the spot. If you couldn't pay the fines, you had to then go into service and work it off. But it was immediate. And this is the one I love about it most of all. In the case law for crimes, there were always reparation for the victims. That's something our law doesn't do. There are people in this state who've been convicted of burning 50 cars. They steal cars, they trash them, they burn them. And then they get put off on remand and they do it again, and they do it again, and they do it again, and they never pay one cent towards restoration of all the damage they have done. Not one cent. If your car is stolen and burnt, you would at least have to pay an excess to your insurance company. You're out of pocket. Then you've got to find another car. You've lost all the belongings in your car. I know one brother whose Bible was in the car when it was burnt. Think what he lost. So all the damage and trouble you go to, or your home is broken into and all smashed up, you feel insecure then after that. You end up buying locks and cameras and things to try and get some form of security back. You've lost a lot. The guy's caught, what does he get? A bag of lollies and don't do it again. Let off on, on probation, home detention or something like that. But Laura Moses said he had to pay back up to four times the value of the damage he'd caused. You see, that, that was a great thing. It made up for the loss, the loss of time, the loss of money, the loss of security. And he had to work that off if he couldn't pay the fine. You see, the law of Moses was very much about protecting those who had been offended against. So what the law of Moses had is what we call case law. God didn't define every single crime one by one. What he did, he said, look, I'm going to give you the principles by which you can then judge crimes. It's sad, isn't it, that the Jews actually made loopholes. You know, they, they ended up with things like the divorce law. Well, God said you could divorce in that situation, but we just expand the terms a bit. Well, God said over here, look, you know, that if you dedicate things to the temple, then it's God gets first preference. We can get out of looking after mum and dad. And that's a sad part about the way that they interpreted the law. They, they made the loopholes bigger to apply them in the wrong sense. But the law is actually were designed to give case examples of how you would, would judge a matter and how you would deal with it when it came to punishment. You can't find a law that says you shall not abuse children. But there are plenty of cases that you can apply to that of how that would be treated. So here's some examples of case law. Think about theft. The only example of theft we have in the whole of the law of Moses is stealing farm animals. There's nothing about stealing jewellery, stealing somebody's plough, none, none of that. It's about farm animals because that was the heart of their life. Most inheritance is dependent upon those animals. So the, the penalty for theft well, if you've stolen somebody's ox and it's still alive and he gets it back, you pay an extra ox because he's lost time looking for that ox. If you've killed it, it's going to cost you four oxen. And that goes to the individual. No, that doesn't go into the government coffers. That goes to the individual because he's lost time. He's now got to find another ox. He's got to train that ox. And he's got the stress of going through all of that. And the case law was... Reparation was important. How different is that to our code of law? Where there are no reparations. Or you might apply to the victims of crime and wait two years and get nothing. But there were always reparations to those who'd been damaged by someone's sinfulness. Well, responsibility. You know, there were laws about caring for people that were in situations where you were employer so you had to have battlements on your, your roof, you, had to have, you couldn't leave holes uncovered. There were safety laws. 
or things put into trust. Somebody said, look, would you look after my dog, donkey or my ass? Uh, and, and they would go off and come back and you've, you'd, oh, look, I'm sorry, it wandered, I don't know where it is. You had to pay for it. You see, there was a sense of responsibility being encouraged. You had to be careful of other things on trust. Safety, well, of course, there was the one example of the uncovered pit on a building site. You're digging a great hole, you think, oh, time to go home. You leave the hole there and somebody falls into it. You are responsible. And that was, again, an example of occupational health and safety in the law of Moses. The law of Moses was remarkable in that aspect, that it actually encouraged OHS. And the law was also very clear that if you were complicit in a crime, if you knew of a crime and said nothing, then you were just as guilty as the offender. Because we have some laws that go somewhere near that, but not nearly far enough. So these were legal precedents. These were cases you could extend into other areas. And you could say, well, that was the principle there. Reparation, responsibility, safety, all of these things, you could extend it into other areas. That's what case law is. Let's look at Deuteronomy 16. It says there in verse uh, 18, Deuteronomy 16, verse 18, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which Yahweh thy God giveth thee, throughout all thy tribes. So there was to be in every tribe, there would be judges and officers who were given responsibility by God. Um, and they had to, to put the right people in those places. Normally God would have some, some part in the choice. But it says in verse 19, you shall not rest judgment, just judgment. They were not to be twisted values. You shall not respect persons, neither take gifts. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. That which is altogether just thou shalt follow. If you look at the margin, it says in the Hebrew, it is the just, just thing. It's one of those Hebraisms where it's repeated. The just, just thing. Just justice. Righteous righteousness shall be followed that you might inherit the land. You see, God's law was altogether just. <coughs> his laws were based upon his impeachable character. God is no respecter of persons. With him, there is no shadow of turning. There's not sort of saying, oh, look at it this way in the case of this person. Well, that person, I don't like him, I'll judge him differently. It's one of the great problems we have as human nature. We have a bias in some situations, either for or against people. Very hard to keep bias out of judgments. How many cases have you seen, even in ecclesial life, where people are absolutely severe on somebody, and then it happens in their own family, and they go to water? Totally different view now on the same matter. You see, that's respect of persons, isn't it? That's not being just in your judgments. Important people are sometimes treated differently because they have all the right connections. Sometimes we're an obligation to people and we can't make good decisions because somehow we, we owe them a favour. God says that which is altogether just has to be followed through. No favouritism allowed. Look at the contrast here to our system. Quite amazing, isn't it? Judges had to be absolutely uncorruptible. You know the sad story of Samuel's sons. They took bribes and perverted justice and they brought a disgrace upon their father. They enabled their father to be criticised by the nation. You see, that was a corrupt judge. There was strict control of commerce and dishonesty. You couldn't have false weights, you know, one buying weight and another weight for selling. Priests and judges had to dispense righteous judgment, absolutely without favour to rich or poor. And there was equal justice for rich and poor. Too often in our society, the rich get away with it because they can, they can afford the expensive QCs. You know, they pay $1,000 an hour for a QC to stand up and to cleverly wind their way out of a case and get them off. Sometimes the poor and uneducated who can't afford a good law are actually convicted of things they didn't do. And then you have the situation where people have been found guilty of a crime in our society. The law says, well, look, you know, they, they actually had their lollies taken away when they were three years old and 
They've had this problem and that problem and that problem, and therefore we'll let them off and we'll, we'll give them a light sentence. God said, no, a crime is a crime. And there were very few mitigating circumstances that were allowed. Look at these superior principles under God's law compared to ours. Fair and consistent penalties applied. And God said specifically in Exodus, there was no difference because a thief is poor. You might say, well, he's a poor man. He's got to steal sometimes. No, a thief is a thief, says God. You know, our problem is that the, the worst thieves in our society are the rich people who get away with all kinds of crimes but are too smart to be caught. God says a thief is a thief. You cannot make difference just because he's poor. Immediate retribution and res restoration was made. The theft of animals, four times the animals was dead. And victims were compensated much more than the loss, as we said, because they had time lost and worry and insecurity. You know, that's a wonderful law, isn't it? That the victims were compensated. There's nothing in our law that goes anywhere near that. So it wasn't just a deterrent, there was good reason for those laws. Well, they had to be respected. Come back to Deuteronomy 17. You know, when the judgment had been made, you notice in verse 10, no room for plea bargaining. You know, what happens in our court system is that a person's got 20 charges, you know, stealing a car, driving through the speed camera, you know, outrunning a policeman. He's got 20 charges on the sheet. So with his smart lawyer, he goes along and says, I'll plead guilty to the first two if you drop the other 18. And to clear the courts, they say, OK, well, you can get off the 18 and we'll just convict you on the two, give you six months without your licence, and away you go. No, God's law's not like that. According to the sentence, whatever is required for that crime has to be done. No commutation of sentences, no parole, no mitigating circumstances to reduce sentences. The point was in verse 13 that people would be deterred from getting involved in crime. So you thought very hard, hard about committing crimes in those days. But it was made the nation secure and safe. People could go to bed at night. People had an idea that there was a law that would catch people out. Now look, there were death penalties under law. This is something, of course, our society says we don't want the death penalty. Which is why we have repeat murderers and repeat rapists walking around in our society. But under God's law, there were crimes that attracted the death penalty. Now, I know some of this is going to be uncomfortable. I'm not saying it to hurt anybody, but this is what the law says. These crimes, the death penalty, murder, rape, incest, bestiality, gross negligence, adultery, homosexuality, wizards and witchcraft, all of those things incurred the death penalty. But there were more. These ones are in a different category. These ones are where there is open defiance. So here's things where people actually say, well, I know what God says, but I don't care. False prophets, idolatry. You've got to deliberately go and find an idol, make an idol to worship it. Blasphemy, sacrilege, that is going into a holy place when you shouldn't be usurping the priesthood, cursing one's parents, and Sabbath breakers. Remember the man that was picking up sticks? He picked up sticks on the Sabbath. God's judgment was, stone him. What had he done to hurt anybody else? He defied a law he clearly knew. He said, I don't care what God says, I'm going to pick up sticks on the Sabbath. And God said, he's, a, he's in defiance. And defiance is something that God will not tolerate. You know, there are many crimes listed in Deuteronomy 24, including murder, for which there was no reduction of sentence. The one thing where you had some way out was manslaughter. So you've killed somebody by accident. You could go to the city of refuge and that was judged whether or not that was an accident, whether or not you were actually responsible for negligence. But the city of refuge was there and you could go there and have the matter properly heard. Foreigners suffered the same punishment as Jews and the one thing that God really hated was mutilation of another person. We'll come back to that in a moment. Anyway, let's move on. 
You know, when you talk about this matter of defiance, Brother Islip Collier made a beautiful comment about this in Conviction and Conduct, where he said this, There are some transgressions for which God has a special sense expressed his abhorrence, and which may therefore be regarded as exceptionally offensive. Apart from this, the depth of a man's guilt is determined not by reference to the degrees of harm he does to other men, but by the degree of deliberateness with which the law is violated. In other words, sins of presumption are always worse than sins of infirmity. Now think about that, the degree of deliberateness with which the law of God is violated. You know, sometimes we do things to hurt other people. We do that because of the weakness of our nature. But where you set out to plan to do something you know is totally wrong, that is a sin of defiance. And God has a very dim view of that. Remember that man, the Sabbath breaker? God said, stone him, because he knew better. Blasphemers, later on there's a case in Numbers where a, a man deliberately blasphemes God. Stone him, said God. He knew what he was doing. They all died in their sin. And you see, God was very clear about that. The deliberateness or the defiance mattered. The false accusations we looked at, I want to come back to that. Because back in Deuteronomy 19, look at this matter, what it says there. I want to deal with something which is, is quite a problem sometimes. Because the rest of that went to say in verse 21, Deuteronomy 19, 21, Thine eyes shall not pity, it shall go life, Life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And one of the criticisms made about the Bible is, is that God encouraged people to punish people by cutting off their feet, poking out their eyes, etc. Not so. God never, ever punished people with mutilation. Yes, there were stripes, there were fines and there were death penalties. That's the three ways the law was enforced. But an eye for an eye or tooth for tooth was a metaphor to indicate that serious crimes were to be punished seriously and severely as a deterrent factor. So it wasn't a matter of saying, look, if a man's you know, taking someone else's foot off, you cut his foot off. God doesn't want more mutilated people walking around. But he said the punishment has to fit the crime. Now, there are three contexts that we have this eye for eye law come up. And here they are, Deuteronomy 19, Exodus 21, and Leviticus 24. Exodus 21, an innocent bystander is killed because men are fighting. So there's a fight going on, and these men, somebody, you know, a punch misses, goes straight through the air, clouts somebody else who falls over and dies. An innocent bystander has been killed. Now, God's regulating fighting. He doesn't want men to fight. He's not encouraging that, but he says if you kill somebody in fighting, it could cost you your life. So it's probably good not to fight. You see how there's a deterrent factor there? Don't get into these situations because the punishment, if you kill somebody in that fight, and it might just be a bystander, you will pay severely for it. In Leviticus 24, deliberate mutilation. So you cut somebody's ear off. You will pay an equivalent price. It might be the death penalty. It might be a long term of, of paying off a debt. But the metaphor is something comparable. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It was never God's intention that people could demand vengeance. He cut off my ear, I want both his ears. You couldn't do that. God did not encourage personal retaliation. But like Deuteronomy 19, God hates liars, he hates false witnesses. They were to suffer what they wanted the other person to get. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You see, it's a metaphor for a serious equivalent punishment. Come to Deuteronomy 22. I want to talk about the protection of, re of reputations. Anyone who's been through a court case knows one thing, is that everybody comes out with their reputation tarnished because the defence lawyers are trying to make you look silly in the witness box and they're trying to make the victim look silly and everyone to blame except the person who did the crime. God says, 
Reputations have to be protected. Deuteronomy 22, verse 17. And remember, this is case law. This is an example of how every way in society would be affected by this case law. Okay, verse 17. This woman's been accused of not being a virgin by her new husband. The evidence is brought forth. Verse 18. The man is proved to be wrong. He's making a false accusation. And in verse 18, the elder of that city shall take that man and chastise him. That means to give him a few whippings. And then he's got to pay. And he can't ever put that woman away for the rest of his life. Now you see, at the very public redemption of a woman falsely accused of, of an, in unchastity, her reputation has been salvaged in public. We might talk later on on Thursday about the water of jealousy. It was exactly the same situation. It was not to find guilty women. It was to justify the innocent. You see, the world completely misreads it. It was to justify the innocent woman. And God is concerned with reputation. Look at chapter 25 and verse 1. You know, I love this verse, I really do. If there be a controversy between men and they come to judgment, the judges may judge and they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And you see, the judges had to make a right decision. You know, there are two proverbs you can put alongside that. This is a really important principle. Yes, sometimes people are wrong. And verse 2 goes on to tell you what you do with that man about the stripes. We'll come back to that in a moment. Wrong is wrong and it must be dealt with. But if somebody has been wrongly accused, you have to justify the righteous. And sometimes, even inside the brotherhood, people are falsely accused or maliciously accused. Sadly, it happens when there are sometimes doctrinal controversies. Personal matters are dragged into the debate and false accusations are thrown around because people can't win the argument. They attack the person. And the Spirit of Christ says that we can't defend ourselves. If we're accused of something we didn't do, we can't get up and demand that we have an apology. That's not the Spirit of Christ. But it doesn't mean others can't step up to the plate. That others should ensure that our good name is not smeared by malicious accusations. Because mud sticks, we all know that. You see, people assume, well, there was an accusation made, there must be something behind it. You know, there's smoke, there must be fire. Not so always. Sometimes there is no fire. There's only malicious intent in the accusation. And we've seen very valuable people sidelined needlessly because nobody stood up to protect them. And there's the principle in Proverbs. It is not good to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the righteous of justice. And I've, I've been involved in cases where people have been maliciously accused of all kinds of things. And we have to make sure their reputations are protected. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to Yahweh. That's coming from Deuteronomy 25, verse 1. And there's a good principle we can take away, that we defend our brethren and sisters against false accusations. You know, there were some great things about God's justice law. No getting off on technicalities. How many cases in our courts are dropped because the police didn't prepare the evidence in the right way? Or they didn't take the statement under the right conditions, and so the person gets off and walks free on a technicality. That's why they employ expensive lawyers to find the loopholes and the mistakes in the police case. Under God's law, no getting off on technicalities. No clever defence. Because in most cases, particularly back here, the judges were divinely guided by God. And you couldn't get away with anything. No prison sentences. Punishment was immediate. Death, stripes or fines. Or both sometimes. Stripes and fines. Look how different this one law is to our legal system. Exodus 22, verse 3. Just go back there. 
Just one example. We could take lots of examples of how different God's law was to man's law. But this one, some of you will remember. Because it happened here in Adelaide not long ago. Exodus 22, verse 3. Verse 2. Verse 2 of Exodus 22. If a thief be found breaking up, that is breaking in, we would say, and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood. So if, if in the daytime, yes, may be. But here's a thief that in the middle of the night, bear in mind they didn't have, you couldn't turn a switch on in those days, you didn't have security systems. Here's a man that breaks into your house in the middle of the night and you lash out to defend yourself and you kill him. Tough. God says, that man, no blood upon your head he broke into your house. He terrified somebody by breaking in at night. No penalty for the person whose house was broken into. We had, an, we had in Adelaide an 85-year-old man that lived down at Bowden. You might remember this case. He was repeatedly broken into by a crazed drug repeat offender who broke into his house, robbed his money, got on off, a, off on a bond, came back and broke into his house terrorised the old man, did this three times and always got out. Well, the fourth time, the old man was waiting for him with a shotgun. Guess who was charged with murder? The 85-year-old man. Now, eventually, the government stepped in because the public was in an uproar over it. They would never have been charged in the law of Moses. You see... That's the difference, isn't it? That's God's law. Very good principles under God's law. You see, this kind of law dissuaded potential thieves. There were always reparations. Look at Exodus 23 and verse 4. If they meet thine enemy's ox with ass going astray, shall surely bring it back to him. Sorry, it should have been Exodus 20, 22 verse 4. Forget it. Um, there were always reparations paid. And that's a good thing about God's law. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 25. Come back to this matter of stripes. Now, in our society, the very thought of caning people would seem to be, or whipping people would seem to be barbaric. That's what they would say, barbaric punishments. Well, there's one nation in the world that still canes people, Singapore. Singapore. Who's been to Singapore? It's probably the safest place in the world to walk around at night. There's no chewing gum on the footpaths. There's no rubbish in the streets. Children stand up to let you have a seat on the train. Why? And there's no graffiti in Singapore. Why? Because all of those are whipping offences. You get the rattan, the big cane. So there's no chewing gum on the streets. You don't drop cans on the street. You don't just throw your McDonald's packets out the window. You see, there's a deterrent effect with that. Well, look at this in Deuteronomy 25. Verse 2. It shall be, the wicked man is worthy to be beaten. The judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten before his face according to the fault by a certain number. So there was a number of stripes for different crimes. Now remember, the innocent had to be fully justified, the sinner had to be beaten with rods, but not too much. Look at verse 3. Forty stripes he may give him and shall not exceed. Which is why the good technically minded Jews beat Paul 39 stripes. <laughs> they didn't want to go to the full 40, they gave him 39 just to be safe. Um, amazing, isn't it? The Jews interpreted this law all wrong. The, the absolute limit for beating was 40 stripes. Because if you did that, if you beat him above that, then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. Isn't that an amazing comment? This is how, De how Deuteronomy is beautiful when it comes to this matter of justice. Yes, he deserves the stripes. But the attitude of the judge toward the offender was now important. We can all make mistakes. We can all do things that we shouldn't have done. And the judge was not to think that he was any better than this person just because he'd made that judgment. 
He did not take away all the dignity of the man by beating him to the point of death. The judge had to think about the fact that he also could be tempted. And that's the law of Christ, isn't it? You know, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 2. Rescue those who are taken under sin. Always being conscious of your own weakness. Knowing you're also tempted in these ways. And the judge had to, to be careful that he thought about that man and not ever despise the man because he'd made a mistake. And we're talking about matters that just justify strife. We're not talking about the things that deserve the death penalty. We're talking about things which were minor crimes that only had the stripes applied to them. Punishment was over, done and dusted. So there was merciful justice under the law. Immediate retribution, but it was done in a way that people cared for. Well, safety laws. It's amazing that so long ago, in the law of Moses, there were laws for safety. Negligence was a criminal offence. On Tuesday, we're going to deal with the matter of what happens when you kill somebody through negligence. When houses were built, because they were flat-topped houses, there had to be a battlement put around them so that people didn't accidentally fall off your roof. You had to secure dangerous animals. You could end up with a death penalty if you killed somebody with an ox that was known to be dangerous. You couldn't leave a dangerous workplace uncovered. And if you did kill somebody through your negligence, then you had to flee to the city of refuge. And if it was decided that it was a matter of your negligence, you could be put to death. Or you could pay a huge fine to get your life back. But if it was judged to be an accident, then you stayed in the city of refuge until the high priest died. That could be 20 years. And you couldn't leave the city of refuge for 20 years maybe. That would ruin your business. You're away from your family. They're probably going to leave their farm and come into the city with you. What a motivation to make sure there were no accidents on your side. Wouldn't you be very, very careful about safety if that was the possibility of having to live in a city of refuge because of an accident that you, you let happen? They didn't have safety glasses and earmuffs in those days, but you would have taken every precaution to make sure your workers were looked after because you were held responsible. Our h &S law is right back in the law of Moses. And we serve the same God, brethren and sisters, the same powerful God. The God who so judged the world that he brought the flood upon the world in the days of Noah. The God who wrote Sodom off the map. The God who said he wanted the Canaanites exterminated. And we now find he's a God accused by the modern world of genocide, of racism and all kinds of other crimes. Let's remember God does not move with the times. God does not follow our crazy, unequal, legal mess that we have in this society. He's a God that will soon judge and destroy the corrupt and wicked of this age. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we agree with that God? Or do we find him unacceptable? Do we find that's a God that we couldn't serve? Because it doesn't fit with modern values. We have to answer that question. what God says is going to happen in the future. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. This is talking about what happens when Christ comes. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. So a man will say, verily there is a reward for the righteous. The life we chose to live has a reward. Verily God judges in the earth. Are we going to be in sympathy with that when God takes away the wicked? Psalm 37, yes, the meek shall inherit the earth and they shall go and look at the place of the wicked and it won't be, there'll be nothing there. And all the dens of iniquity, this world is, it was devised, the evil abominations you can find on the internet, the gambling dens, the, the places of, of all kinds of debauchery that this world has invented, they will be taken away. They will not exist anywhere. You can go and look for them, says God, and you won't find them. 
It's all going to go. The wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. And the kingdom is going to start, brethren and sisters, with a great judgment upon the wickedness of man. And after that, God's just and good law will come into place upon this earth. Just think about what the Bible says. Isaiah 26 verse 9. With my soul ever desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me, I will seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. They don't know much about it now, but they will learn what real righteousness is. And there are many things that we know will happen in the kingdom which will reflect almost exactly the law of Moses. Of the keeping of the feasts of Yahweh. The Feast of Tabernacles being kept year by year as the nations go up to Jerusalem. Sacrifice and offerings restored that they might remember in retrospect the work of Christ as the Jews used it to look forward to the work of Christ. No more Canaanites or their kind left in the earth and a very similar code of civil law Look at Isaiah 66. You know, this is what we look forward to in the kingdom and God willing, God will give us the opportunity to be part of it. Providing we're in sympathy with his justice principles. Verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I he will make shall remain before me, saith Yahweh, so shall your seed and your name remain. It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith Yahweh. And there will be a deterrent effect. They shall go forth and look upon the carcasses, the men that have transgressed against me. Haman Gog. And even those in the kingdom that have rebelled against God will be there as a warning to the inhabitants of the world in the kingdom. A deterrent effect. And you see that God's law is going to come to the earth again. So let us not be deceived by the current world's wisdom in its justice system. Let's not be deceived by the morals that they think are correct. And let's never imagine we can change what God is because he won't change just because we have. Let's not assume that God is not concerned anymore with wickedness in the earth. He most certainly is. Let us all remember that God determines right from wrong, not man. And let us pray for the day when God's judgment shall be in the earth and the inhabitants will learn true righteousness.